Hey everybody, this is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today we're gonna to be talking about Danley Sound Labs SH50. This is a pro audio speaker, not intended for home audio use, but when I was at Danley Sound Labs a few months ago to listen to their Hyperion speaker, which I'll link the video up here, that, that speaker sounds phenomenal, by the way. We got to talking about this speaker and the Klippel near fill scanner and how I might be able to measure it because they were talking about maybe considering getting a near fill scanner of their own. And I said, well, hey, let me take the speaker home, uh, try it out just to see how it works because it would be a challenge for me. And then they would get some data out of it as well to see if it backs up some of the stuff that they've done. And I thought, you know, that, cool, it's a win-win. So here we are. Uh, again, I do want to stress that this is a pro audio speaker. And when I say that, I mean like uh, amphitheaters, church halls, uh, big concert venues, not inside a mixing studio, That not that kind of pro audio thing, okay? This is a live event sound reinforcement speaker. It's a huge speaker. It weighs about 130 pounds, uh, waterproof, you know, all sorts of coating on it. I think it's 28 by 28 square on the front, trapezoid shape all around. This is a Synergy horn designed by Tom Danley. It features, I believe, four, what is it? Let me go down here and double check because I tend to forget things. Uh, let's see here. Two 12-inch midwoofers, four five-inch mid-ranges, and one high-frequency compression driver. And you'll notice this design is really quite odd. Um, this is because these are acoustic low-pass filters, and there's a lot of work and science behind the speaker that, frankly, I don't understand. I have no problem telling you guys that I don't understand all of it. It's not something I've dug into. I just more am appreciative of the final result and what Tom is doing. If you want to check more information about that, then I will link to the Danley website where I'm sure there are tons of white papers that you can go and read about and you can school me on it and tell me how I'm a doofus for not knowing all this stuff. I'm fine with that. Let's see here. So the tweeter is located right here. The mid ranges are located on each side of the speaker. And then the big woofers, the 12 inch woofers are right here. And there's one up there. Now, all the data we're about to go through is on my website, which I will also link in the description below. I'm going to go ahead and tell you First off, this is just one speaker that I tested. I did listen to it in my house, but with it being you know, a live event speaker, I don't really know how to treat it as far as sound demos go for a home audio setup where you're three or four meters away. Um, initially, when I listened to this speaker, it just didn't sound right to me. Then I went and looked at the data. I saw some of the things that were there, not necessarily resonances, but just additional maybe summation in the frequency response. So I took an EQ, just two bands of EQ, knocked a couple of frequencies down and I was good to go. And that kind of goes back to the live sound nature. This speaker is a passive speaker. It's expected that you're gonna use some equalization on it. And therefore that's how you get to where you get with this. Uh, the one thing that really stood out about the speaker was that everything sounded like it originated from one point in space behind the speaker. It's just, soundstage depth, even in mono, was just crazy. And I talk about some of that in my other reviews of like Kef speakers, the, the Kef coincident speakers, as well as the Cali Audio coincident coaxial speakers. All of those types of speakers tend to have that effect. And it, it, told, it may be 100% because it's sighted, biased listening. I'm fully aware of that. And I'm laying that out to you so you understand where I'm coming from. But that's what I think I hear. So that's what I'm telling you. That's what I think I hear. This speaker gets incredibly loud. I mean, I think it, it, no problem. I think I got it to about 120 or 130 dB in my living room with just one. I mean, good Lord. So if you wanted to buy a pair of these, which I think they retail for a $4,000 USD for a one. Now that price may be a little bit different. And if, uh, if I'm incorrect about that, then I'll make sure to put a, uh, a comment below this. So if you're interested, you can either contact Danley or you can just check my comments for that. But having said that, you know, it's just a ridiculous speaker. If you wanted to use it for home, it takes well to equalization. You could put it on top of a subwoofer. This thing goes down to 20 or not 20, but 50 Hertz. So it does need a subwoofer um, and just rock your, you know, melt the face, melt the face off, melt your face off. It's just crazy. It's in a totally different league from what I'm used to testing. And I really want to stress that up front because when you go and look at the results, it's gonna be something different than you're used to. And with that said, now let's go into the results. Now this actually came off the shelf from Danley. So they took a forklift, got it off the shelf and me and a Danley employee loaded in the back of my Honda Civic hatchback. And I drove five hours back home, 
basically dragging the ground. So that was an experience. Um, this is all tested using my Clipple Near Field Scanner, which is a way to get anechoic data or better than anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage. I had an interview with one of the designers, Christian DeBellman. If you want to read or hear a little bit more about the Near Field Scanner, uh, make sure you go to my website, click this link and watch that. It's about two hours long, but it's Man, if you're interested in this stuff, it's very interesting information. A couple things about this speaker that I want to note up front. When I tested it, I wasn't really sure where the reference point was. And, and Tom said, you know, I believe he told me that it was at the tweeter. Um, but for the purpose of measurements, you know, I wasn't sure if I should make the reference point at the tweeter or if I should make it at the baffle. Again, this was part of the reason I wanted to test the speaker is because it was new to me. So this may seem obvious to some of you. If you're a pro audio person watching this, you're like, well, duh, you idiot. That's fine. I'm okay with that. I want to learn. So this is part of learning experience for me. So I measured it both ways. I set the reference point at the baffle, which is just the open space at the front of the speaker where a grill would normally go. And then I'll also put the reference point at the very, very, like the, the most inner portion of the, of the speaker, like right in front of the tweeter. I did it both ways. And then I actually took it outside and did some ground plane measurements at two meters and at four meters. And I found the match to be Really no surprise to most people, I'm assuming, is that it is right in front of the tweeter. So that's where the point of origin is, and that's where I made it, and that's where all this data stems from. Now, getting into the results, let's see what we've got here. Um, yeah, we can see that there are certainly some things that are not flat in response about this speaker. These two particular areas around 1 kilohertz and around 250 hertz, I took an EQ to those and knocked those down in my listening, and I was okay with that. The thing is that this speaker does behave well with EQ because we can see that we have a pretty constant directivity through the mid-range from low bass to the mid-range up through here. And then it kind of plateaus around one kilohertz and then it runs flat again. Now, there are some areas that probably won't take as well to EQ, but these two particular areas will take well to EQ if you want to do that. As far as sensitivity goes, again, this is a passive speaker. I would say on average at my measurement conditions, 2.83 volts at one meter, spec'd out to be around, I think, 97 dB. And that is plenty powerful. The bandwidth of the speaker, you can see, I think it's about, what, 3 dB down at maybe 60 hertz or so. So 60 hertz to 20 kilohertz with some EQ applied to knock some of these things down. Uh, you've got a very, very high output speaker with some good linearity. Now, this is a predicted interim response. Again, this is a prediction for a standard room, but this is a loudspeaker that is not intended for standard rooms. The impedance for the speaker, pretty easy speaker to drive. Uh, I don't believe it dips below four ohm except for a couple points. There's one at 100 and then one at 1K, but with a sensitivity, that's not really an issue. I'm not saying you can run it with an AVR. If you're a home audio person, and you're really wanting to play around with something like this, uh, you might be able to. I would think you're probably still going to need a dedicated power amp for it, though. I don't think a, a standard AVR is going to do it for you here. Now, let's look at the glow plots that I create. And then for me, this is useful to give you an idea of the radiation pattern of the speaker. And what I'm seeing generally, if you can ignore the peaks and the dips here and just kind of mentally see what's going on. Um, I think I said that this is about plus or minus 30 degrees, and it might actually be closer to about plus or minus 20 degrees. Uh, and it kind of just depends on where you're looking at. Once you go in and add EQ, I think you're going to be closer to plus or minus 30 degrees horizontally, which means that as you go beyond plus or minus 30 degrees, either way to the side of the speaker, the SPL is going to start dropping off quite a bit. So, you know, you kind of want to stay in that general area. But the cool thing is, is that as you move around to the speaker, it still maintains a good profile of sound. It's going to sound very similar in front of it as it is to the side, it's just gonna be lower and level to the side. And because this speaker is basically fully symmetrical all the way around, you still have the same result vertically as you do horizontally. Now let's talk about distortion. At 86 dB, until about 60 Hertz, you're well below 1% THD. And then at 96 dB, uh, there is something going on around 900 Hertz that causes the second order distortion to creep up quite a bit. But being second order, I don't, I don't think that's going to be an issue to anybody. And usually I don't even care about distortion unless it's really, really high where it's more indicative of failure modes or something along those lines. On the low end, again, below about 60 hertz, that's where the distortion starts to ramp up. But we expect that because we know that the response rolls off below 60 hertz. Here's the dynamic range showing what happens as you go from 76 dB to 102 dB. And each of these colors represents a step, 86 dB, 96 dB, and then 102 dB. And what we're seeing is even at 102 dB in purple, 
Uh, you don't really reach significant compression issues until you're about 70 hertz. Most people that are using this, uh, in fact, probably I would think everybody that's using this speaker is going to have a subwoofer flanking it. And then the compression on the low end at the higher output levels, it's not going to be as significant. Now, in terms of long-term SPL, at 86 dB, when you play it for about two minutes and then at four minutes total, this is full multi-tone stimulus. There's no change in the response. Then at 96 dB, again, no change in the response, which means that you can play the speaker loud and for a long time and it doesn't overheat the coils and it doesn't really start to fail. Now, maybe a few hours, this might change, but for the testing purposes that I do, you know, most people are going to be in a home listening to a speaker. You're not going to be listening at 96 dB full tilt for four minutes. I mean, I just can't imagine anybody really doing that. And that's going to do it for this review. I do want to thank the folks at Danley Sound, and I definitely want to thank Tom because when I got this speaker and brought it home to test, I actually sent the results to Tom a few times just to make sure, hey, is this passing the sanity check? Because again, this was a new design to me something I hadn't tested before. And I wanted to make sure before I published the data that it at least made sense. You know, like, what am I going to do with it? That's something else. But I want to make sure that it makes sense before I publish something that may be incorrect. And Tom was nice enough to take my emails. Actually, we, we talked on the phone a couple of times about it. So I really want to thank Tom for taking the time to, to help me through this because they have all this data. They, they know what their speaker does. This really was an exercise for me, in my opinion, and they were gracious enough to loan me the speaker and allow me the opportunity to measure the speaker and learn a little bit more about my system and some different test methodologies. So uh, again, I just want to thank them and thank you all for watching. I hope you appreciate it. I hope you learned something. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments below. Again, I'll drop the link to this review in my description. And with that said, I'm out. Y'all take care. Peace.